Well, welcome back to our series, Roaming the Sierra Nevada Foothills. Today, we're going to investigate something different. We're going to investigate an anomaly. Well, I think it's kind of an anomaly, because normally when we think of the Sierra Nevada, we think of gigantic, towering granite peaks. We think of Yosemite and Yosemite Falls. We think of volcanic formations. But today, we're going to look at a sedimentary formation a formation that helped build the modern economy of California. We're going to investigate calcium carbonate, better known as limestone. I'm tired of videos on the gold rush. We want videos on calcium carbonate, right guys? Yeah! yeah! I admit, I bribed Roseville's Oakmont High School students with free t-shirts show a little excitement for calcium carbonate, better known as limestone. You have to admit that California's gold rush produced interesting characters, instant fortunes, songs, poetry, heroes, and villains. Even the origins on how gold came to be on Earth is fascinating. Astrophysicists believe gold arrived on Earth over 4.5 billion years ago as the result of neutron stars colliding. The romance of gold has overshadowed the fact that California also mined other minerals, from asbestos to zinc. The 1906 Bureau of Mines reported over 40 major minerals being mined in California. In today's dollars, in 1906, California's mining industry was producing about one and a half billion dollars in products. Gold's origin is billions of years old and is not of our world. It is a metal imported from some far off galaxy. I'm looking for a rock made in California, a rock that helped make California into the fifth largest economy in the world. That rock is an ugly sedimentary rock known as limestone. While gold could buy you commodities, calcium carbonate or limestone, a dark, gray, boring rock built California's economy. California's geologic history is complicated. Our story begins in the Permian period. The Permian period began about 299 million years ago and lasted until about 252 million years ago. Because of massive volcanic activity, the Permian period ended with Earth's third and most destructive massive extinction of life. During the Permian period, the topography as we know California today did not exist. What was here was a shallow warm sea with a group of arc islands and a coral reef named Hover Reef. It is here in the shallow warm sea that we have the birth of California and the creation of limestone. While limestone could be created in a number of different ways, the most common type of limestone was created through a biological process. Our story begins in an unlikely location, Australia's Great Barrier Reef. The Smithsonian Magazine published an article featuring a sea creature known as a sea cucumber. The article caught my eye as the article helps to explain the biological creation of a sedimentary rock known as limestone. The article centers around sea cucumbers living in the warm waters of the Australian Barrier Reef, conditions much like the conditions in the seas 250 million years ago in what is today California. The sea cucumber has a soft body and is tube in shape. As an invertebrate, it has no backbone. It is related to the starfish and the sea urchin but looks nothing like either of these two creatures. The sea cucumber has an anus and a mouth. It breathes through its anus. It does not have a brain. Fossils indicate that the sea cucumbers can be dated back in time 400 million years. There have been five mass extinctions of life in Earth's history. The sea cucumber has survived all five. The sea cucumber caught Australian scientists' interest because of the amount of poop a single cucumber can produce. Its species is rich in nutrients, vital for building healthy reefs and providing nutrients for other sea creatures. 
The sea cucumber's fecal matter contains high levels of calcium carbonate, which is the key ingredient in limestone. Australian scientists used the sea cucumber as their test animal, trying to determine how much poop these unusual sea creatures could produce. Their findings showed that a single cucumber excreted 30.8 pounds of fecal matter per year. In the seven square miles area studied, three million cucumbers could produce 64,000 metric tons of poop. We can visualize how sea creatures, like the sea cucumbers, created mountains of fecal matter. Their fecal matter joined with shells and skeletons settled to the ocean floor. During the 47 million years of the Permian period, in the warm, shallow ocean of what would become California, a reef grew. We have named the reef Hover's Reef. We perceive that our continents are immobile land masses tethered securely to Mother Earth. In reality, the continents have been shifting apart for millions of years. They themselves are also broken into shifting tectonic plates. For our discussion, two California plates will help us understand how Hover Reef wound up in the Sierra foothills. As the diagram illustrates, Hover's Reef sat on the Farallon Plate 100 million years ago, the Farallon Plate, being heavier than the westward-moving North American Plate, became a subduction plate, sliding under the North American Plate, sinking ever deeper into the Earth's mantle. Tectonic plate movements generates heat, which is also amplified by pressure when two land masses come in contact with each other. As a result, Hover's Reef was compressed and cooked into limestone. Tethered to the doomed, sinking, crumbling Farallon Plate, Hover's Reef moved east and was eventually uplifted and twisted into the formation we see today. Hover's Reef represents a small fossil fragment of what once was the Farallon Tectonic Plate. Take Interstate 80 east. In Auburn, exit onto Highway 49, heading south to Placerville. Within a few miles, the Highway 49 will dip, and you will then take a sharp right turn over the bridge crossing the American River. On your right, you will see an old concrete bridge also crossing the American River. The concrete bridge will be part of our tale a little later. Stay on Highway 49. In about a quarter of a mile, you will see on your left the parking lot for the old limestone quarry. The parking fee is $10, strictly enforced. Once parked, take the 1.3 mile quarry trail. The quarry trail parallels the middle fork of the American River. The trail was once a railroad spur which was connected to the concrete bridge you passed earlier. The spur's ultimate destination was Auburn and the main line to the Transcontinental Railroad. As you walk, look closely, you will see remnants of the old spur. The short trail will take you to what was once the largest limestone quarry on the west coast. This is the end of the spur. Freight trains came up here to load up hopper cars of limestone. The limestone was mined up the hill loaded into the top of this concrete structure, crushed and dropped into the hopper cars. As we walk back along the old rail bed, I would be remiss if I did not mention a few words about the old concrete bridge we had passed earlier. To connect the limestone quarry to the transcontinental line, a distance of just seven miles, the rail line needed to cross the American River. In 1910, bridge construction began. Using a radical new construction technique, the bridge would become the largest railroad reinforced concrete structure of its era. The bridge was designed to withstand the heaviest train engine, including hopper cars filled with limestone rock. The construction crew building the bridge numbered 800 men. The 482 foot bridge was completed in just two years. Sadly, two workers died in the construction. To reach the transcontinental line, an additional 17 wooden trestle bridges were also built. In Auburn, the limestone would be reloaded onto Southern Pacific Railroad hopper cars heading west 
to Solano County, near Fairfield. To process the limestone, a new industrial city was created. The manufacturing site was chosen as there were additional limestone deposits as well as a gravel quarry. The manufacturing site was aptly named Cement City. Besides the industrial buildings and limestone and gravel quarries, Cement City built homes, a hospital, a hotel, a jail, a school, and a store. At this time, Pacific Portland Cement Company owned both Cement City and the quarries in the Sierra foothills to feed the processing facility in Solano County. The Sierra Mountain Quarry, operated by 150 to 200 men, produced 450,000 tons of limestone per year. They shipped 1,200 tons per day. How limestone was processed into plaster, cement, and concrete, as well as other products, we will deal with a little later. For now, let us take a walk. Spring is a perfect time to walk across the old concrete bridge. Locals call the bridge No Hands Bridge. Not to worry as there are safety rails. Its official name is Mountain Quarries Bridge. The walk to Calcutta Falls is just 1.3 miles. Where the trestles once were, there are now short walk-around loops. Bring water, hat, and sturdy shoes. The confluence of the North Fork and the South Fork of the American River is one of the most popular picnicking, walking, hiking, swimming, biking, or rafting parks in the Sierra foothills. Parking is limited. Try to visit midweek. We need to return to the Mountain Limestone Quarry site. And one last tale at the park. My trail guide, Herb Tanamoto, awaits us. Herb is a docent for the American River Conservancy. Our destination is Hover's Cave. To understand how Hover's Cave and other Sierra limestone caves were formed, we need to travel back in time. The last major epoch in Earth's history was the Pleistocene. This epoch began 2,580,000 years ago and lasted to just about 11,700 years ago. During the Pleistocene, California, as we know our state today, will become more recognizable. The colliding plates cause uplifting of the Sierra. Think of a wedge where the eastern Sierra reaches into the sky, slanting downward towards the Sacramento Valley. Our central valley will also rise, transforming the Permian period's shallow ocean into a freshwater marshland, and in the southern San Joaquin Valley, a large inland freshwater lake will form. The lake will drain out into the ocean through Monterey Bay. For over 40 million years, the Sierra Nevada mountains was uplifted to its present height. The batholith of granite slowly cooled. Erosion would peel away the topsoil, revealing the Sierra's beautiful granite peaks. The Pleistocene epoch will also be an era of cyclical glaciation. Glaciers will further sculpt our Sierra mountains. While looking placid today, the South Fork must have raged from melting glaciers, enough force to split Hafer's Reef into two leaving a smaller limestone formation on the north side of the river. Besides tectonic plate movement or glaciation, one other force of nature will impact our story, one you might not even suspect, the interaction between rain and limestone. As droplets of water fall to earth from the atmosphere, rain picks up carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an acid. As the rain strikes the ground, it will also pick up CO2 from organic debris. Over thousands of years, as the slightly acidic water percolates through the joints of the limestone, rock formations of limestone can dissolve. Come with me to my laboratory. My lab assistants will show you a simple experiment. Tums is an antacid made from calcium carbonate. Think of a Tums tablet as a limestone formation. Since we don't have a million years, we will just pour a little vinegar, which is an acid, onto the Tums. Presto, the Tums dissolves. A limestone cave is born. In 
some cases, the percolating acidic water becomes an amalgamate of water and dissolved lime. What if the amalgamate drips slowly from the cave ceiling, leaving pure lime to slowly harden? A stalactite is created. From the ground up, a stalagmite builds towards the stalactite. Created over thousands of years and beautiful as they are, they were gold to miners as the formation was pure lime. In the 1880s, miners looking for limestone discovered Hover's Cave. I guess they weren't too excited as the discovery did not result in any further mining operations. Skip forward to 1906. High school students entered the cave. Excited, they informed their Auburn dentist who they knew was interested in paleontology. At this point in our story, we need a drum roll. Dr. John C. Harvard was indeed interested. And on December 2nd, 1906, Dr. Harvard entered the cave. His discovery of not only calcite formations, but prehistoric animal fossils, but also human fossil bones. His discovery would open a new chapter in the ancient history of our Sierra Nevada foothills. 19,000 years ago, the first hunter-gatherers occupied California. Caves would have made a safe, desirable abode. Within Hover's cave, paleontologists discovered four human remains, estimated age 10,000 years old. UC paleontologists also discovered a jigsaw puzzle of 400 fossils of animal bones, some fossils dating back 13,000 years. Mixed in were bones of contemporary animals. UC Berkeley's anthropology department retained the collection of Hoffer's fossils they discovered through 1918. However, here in Rockland, Sierra College's Natural History Museum has dedicated a showcase to the Paleolithic history of Hoffer's Cave. On your walk, did you notice the fourth highest bridge in the United States? The proposed Auburn Reservoir would have inundated Hoffer Cave. A new road and bridge was needed to connect Auburn to the historic mining town of Forest Hill. In anticipation of Hoffer Formation being flooded, UC Davis did one final archaeological sweep. Along the proposed flooded site, the archaeologists found a number of First Peoples burial sites. Inside Hover Cave, a human tooth was found. No date was given. All construction on the Auburn Dam ceased when an earthquake fault was discovered. The fault extended from Horrible to the proposed dam site. One last mystery. How did these massive paleolithic-sized animals find their way into Hover's Cave? Hover's Cave entrance would seem large enough for large animals' easy access. However, 10,000 years ago, the large entrance did not exist. After the university finished their research, the quarry owners realized the cave was directly over where they were mining limestone. They enlarged the entrance and bored a tunnel to the other side of the formation. This way, the mine could run ore carts directly through the new opening, making it easy to bring limestone to the crusher. While Hover's Cave is close to visitors, there are a number of lime caves that do welcome guests. From Sequoia National Park to Shasta Lake, you will find interesting formations to explore. For those in the Sacramento area, this is an easy drive. In fact, a two-for-one tour. Black Chasm Cavern will be our first stop. Close by is Indian Grinding Stone State Park. As you will see, the two parks do have a connection to the same limestone formation. But our first stop, let's go spelunking. Black Chasm Cavern is a family-run attraction and is also a national natural landmark. Our host and guide, Derek, awaits. Besides stalactites and stalagmites, what sets this limestone formation off from the other caverns is a limestone formation called helictites. To understand how helictites are created, visualize a straw. Helictites are hollow. 
Air pressure forces acidic water and diluted lime through straw-like capillaries. At the end of the capillary, a drop of lime remains. Each drop increases the size of the helictite. Helictites seem to defy gravity. They are the most delicate of formations. Upon leaving the cavern, Derek pointed out an overhead rock. The rock was not limestone, but marble. How did marble intrude into a limestone formation? Remember, we began our story with organic matter in a shallow warm sea. Through tectonic plate movement, the organic matter was heated and transformed into limestone. As the Farallon plate pushed deeper into the Earth's mantle, some of the limestone became superheated through metamorphosis. This block of limestone was transformed into marble. I mentioned a second stop. A short drive from Black Cavern is Indian Grinding Stone State Park. This is a must-see stop. Be sure to hear the ranger's presentation on how the Miwok used native plants for their medicine, food, tools, shelter, clothing, and fuel. Take the park's short nature walk encircling the park. Taking center stage is the large grinding stone formation. Anthropologists would refer to this as bedrock mortars. Unlike the bedrock mortars found throughout the Sierra foothills, where indigenous people created their bedrock mortars in granite, here the Miwok used bedrock marble. You might say that the Miwok were the pioneers of marble kitchen countertops. Back at Hoffer's limestone formation, if you hike up to the climbing wall, walk south to where the trail ends and listen. On the other side of the hill, limestone is still being quarried. Unrefined limestone does have many uses, just as it is. Crushed, it is used for walkways, road base, and retaining walls. Limestone is mixed with iron ore, then placed in a furnace. The result is pig iron. Pig iron is the central metal in manufacturing steel. Pelton turbines made of steel turned running water into usable energy. Farmers use crushed limestone to neutralize acidic soil. Refined lime was also needed. Spreckles Sugar Company owned a quarry on Hoffer's limestone formation. Sparkles needed refined lime in processing sugar beets and sugar cane. The construction industry needed refined lime in manufacturing mortar, cement, and concrete. You will find calcium carbonate in some of the strangest places, even toothpaste. The secret of extracting lime from limestone goes back thousands of years. Burning limestone produced a white powder called quicklime. About 4,000 years ago, the Egyptians added water, sand, and quicklime together, creating plaster. The plastered walls were then decorated for posterity. Ancient Roman engineers learned by adding volcanic ash to lime. The mixture created a wondrous, enduring, strong, and waterproof cement. Roads, aqueducts, and buildings endure even to today. In California, Catholic mission fathers used an old Roman formula to plaster the interior and exterior of their missions. Three parts water to one part quick lime. From the copious mounds of seashells gathered, mission fathers could create quick lime. The gold rush brought a new demand for both plaster and mortar. Rampant fires destroyed many mining towns. If you wanted to protect your store or bank, Build with brick and mortar. Our Sierra foothills provided all that was necessary to create quick lime. Limestone was available. Our foothills also provided wood for the fire, granite rock for the construction of the kiln. 19th century entrepreneurs realized there was a great demand for quick lime. Enter Henry Cowell. He owned kilns in a number of locations in Northern California. One is still in existence here in El Dorado County. 
Unfortunately, it is behind a locked gate. Cowell was once known as the Baron of Lyme. If his name sounds familiar, yes. In Felton, California, Henry Cowell Redwood State Park is named after him. My search for a kiln to photograph continued. Once again, Herb Tanamoto came to my rescue. The American River Conservancy had an old kiln on a parcel of land the Conservancy owned located along the South Fork of the American River. The kiln was strategically located upstream from the once prosperous gold mining town of Mormon Island. Mormon Island was flooded when the new Folsom Dam was constructed in the 1950s. As we hiked along the trail, Herb pointed to the kiln built against the hillside. Okay, we're inside the kiln, and um, when it was uh, built, it had a roof, probably a rock, and some of the rubble here is probably from the roof that was once here. It also had a floor, and the floor had a little eye under it, a hole, so oxygen could come up into the kiln. They would load wood for fire, and then they would add the limestone, and the limestone at that is very hard, but it's still a sedimentary rock. And they would pile it up as high as they could and set it on fire. It had to get up to about 2,000 degrees, maybe a little bit more. Too little, and it wouldn't free the CO2, the carbon dioxide that's locked within the rock. Too much heat, and it would destroy the mortar that would be created. So then it would take the first day to load it, the second day would be to uh, set it on fire, the third day would be to um, let it cool, and then the fourth day they could take the mortar out that had been created, the powder. And then there's a road just on the other side here, it was an old wagon road, and that wagon road then could be loaded with sacks of the mortar and taken to town and sold at the local market. Did Mike say mortar? What he should have said was, the kiln produced quicklime. Quicklime could only produce a weak form of mortar or plaster. By the 19th century, the Romans' formula for cement had been lost in time. Dorset, England, 1824, an innovation would change history when William Aspidin patented an improved cement. He named his new product after the location of his quarry, Portland. Aspidin learned that a mixture of crushed limestone and clay baked in a kiln produced clinkers. To the clinkers he added 2 to 3 percent gypsum. The mixture was then ground into a fine powder. His invention, Portland Cement, would revolutionize construction around the world. Why are we here? I'm taking my friend Don on a ride. Don is a docent for the American River Conservancy. I want to first explain the backstory on why Highway 40 and our other federal highways were built. The story is also the story of the importance of concrete. The formula for making concrete is simple. Mix Portland cement with gravel. As the Romans learned, the product was so strong it could last centuries. Our federal highways would eventually stretch over 200,000 miles. As we travel on old Highway 40, the pavement we are traveling on could be older than a century. To build our national highway system, a lot of concrete would be needed. A conspiracy story created a maelstrom, resulting in the need to build a modern federal highway system. In World War I, Japan and England were allies. Along the Mexican west coast, Japanese and British warships were on the hunt for German ships who might be hiding in Baja California's bays. As the Japanese and British warships searched, the Japanese warship Asama ran aground in Turtle Bay. The captain of the Asama sent an explanation to the American Naval Command in San Diego. Not wanting to abandon the ship, rescue crews from Japan were sent to refloat the Asama. The story should have ended here, however. William Randolph Hearst, whose newspapers were highly influential, charged that the accident was a cover-up for a Japanese invasion of California. Hearst was already spreading stories that 30,000 Japanese immigrants living here on the West Coast were a fifth column. According to Hearst, 
Japan wanted to buy Turtle Bay. Hearst said the Japanese wanted to build a military base and also develop a Japanese colony. The colony was a cover for hiding Japanese soldiers. Japan's ultimate goal was to invade California. The story was also supported by California's Senator Phelan. Of course, this was a hoax. There was no Japanese colony in Mexico. There was no invasion. The Asama was refloated and headed home. Rumors of Japanese invasion did not end, but continued as distrust between Japan and the United States grew. Back in Washington, military planners pondered, what if an invasion of our west coast occurred? Japan, once seen as an ally, was suddenly seen as a military threat. How quickly could the United States transfer troops and supplies from the East Coast to California? The military needed an acid test. Just 18 months after the close of World War I, on July 7, 1919, a convoy of 309 United States soldiers left Washington, D.C. on a 3,389-mile journey to San Francisco. The route would follow the 1913 National Lincoln Highway. Traveling west, the convoy took 62 days, averaging just 6.07 miles per hour. If there ever were a national emergency, the test run proved that the United States highway infrastructure was inadequate. The Lincoln Highway in many locations was nothing more than a sand trap. Immediate attention was needed to show the importance of constructing a new federal highway system General John J. Pershing of World War I fame was given the task. General Pershing's report called for building 78,000 miles of federal highways, both urban and rural. Concrete was the preferred surface. Looking on was a young officer, Dwight David Eisenhower. In 1926, the new Bureau of Public Roads created a numbering system for United States highways to connect San Francisco, California, to the East Coast, Highways 40 and 50 were designated. Highway 66 would begin in Los Angeles and end in Chicago. The paving of the three highways would not be completed until well after World War II. In 1960, Interstate 80 paved over numerous locations of Highway 40. However, there are still sections of Historic 40 that still exist. Today, we will travel east on Historic Highway 40, traveling through Rockland, Loomis, and Penryn. On Highway 40, just before entering Auburn, is our destination, a roadside monument to Highway 40. The other reason that we're here is I wanted to show the use of concrete. And limestone is the important ingredient in concrete. And to make concrete, you need um, pebbles and rocks added to cement. And an example of how limestone was used to build California's economy. That's why we're here. Let's take another look at the monument. Highway 40 was built directly over the Lincoln Highway. The bottom slab is from the earlier Lincoln Highway. The top pour was from Highway 40. Notice the difference in thickness. New specifications for concrete thickness were needed for newer, heavier vehicles. All tales have to come to an end, even the exciting story of limestone. If you are ever traveling to or from the Sierra Nevada on US Interstate 5, Take the slow route, Historic Highway 40. Check out Donner's Summit Historical Society for travel suggestions. And while traveling over our network of concrete roads and bridges, we remember our story began 250 million years ago when a pile of poop began our tale.
Thank you for watching another adventure roaming our Sierra Nevada foothills and its watersheds. If you enjoyed this program, check out my website, www.youtube.com slash at MichaelStark1. Oh, I'm totally responsible for the contents of this video.